Hi everyone, welcome back. Today's case is another Canadian one and it is the case of Tim Bosma who disappeared after going on a test drive with two men who were interested in buying his truck. And yes, this is a solved case and it is actually a solved serial killer case. I know I do a lot of unsolved cases and a lot of missing persons cases which I think are extremely important because they take place in real time and there's still people missing and justice that needs to be served but I did want to switch it up a little bit on you guys and do a case that was actually solved for once. I know I say this a lot, like I say like no one covers some of these stories I talk about, but I've actually only seen True Crime Daily and The Fifth Estate cover this case and it is actually one of the most prolific cases like in and around Toronto area. So I'm surprised that no one's really covered it. I was actually racking my brain yesterday, going to work, trying to decide like what I should film next and this case came to mind. I was 18 when it happened. I remember it all over the news. I remember everybody being really scared and wanting to know what was going on. Again, it was a huge case in Toronto and I'm so surprised that no one else has covered it. And this is one of those cases that's just so scary because it's such a normal thing to sell your things online and to meet up with strangers to sell these things. You know, you're selling a vehicle, the person comes over to test drive it. It's a normal thing. You know, you always want to test drive something before you buy it to make sure that it's running properly. And normally nothing happens, you know? The person buys it, they decide they don't want it, whatever. But in this case, Tim was kidnapped and murdered. It's definitely a case that creeps me out, but there's a lot of lessons to be learned in it. In just researching this case, I probably cried like at least 50 times because just listening to Tim's wife, which I will show you the videos a little bit after, but just listening to her um, do interviews and talk on the news and just really thinking about everything involved in this case, it is such a sad, case and these are all murders that didn't need to happen so i'm gonna get into obviously why i just said all of that but i think we need to start at the beginning and talk about who tim was tim bosma was a 32 year old contractor who was living in a rural part of hamilton ontario called ancaster and he was living there with his wife charlene and their young daughter he was a country music pickup truck loving kind of guy he was just a normal 32 year old man. But in 2013, Tim's Dodge Ram pickup truck was starting to become a money pit for the family and so they decided to sell it and they listed it online. Nothing out of the ordinary, right? So Tim lists his truck and a few weeks go by and he's not really getting many calls for it. No one's really interested in it until one day Tim gets a call from two guys that are very interested in buying his truck. And these two men ask if they could come over and test drive it. As I said, you know, you want to buy a used vehicle, you're going to want to make sure it runs. On May 6th, around 9.20 p.m., these two men start walking up the driveway and they ended up telling Charlene that their friend dropped them off nearby and they walked over, which would have been my first huge red flag. And it seemed to be Tim and Charlene's too. Why would these two men show up so late at night to view a truck in the dark? Like normally you want to check out a vehicle in the daylight so you can see if there's any scratches on it, if anything's broken, missing, etc. Like you, why would you come at the middle of the night? And Tim told his wife how he felt uneasy about it. And like right there, just bad vibes. He was getting the bad vibes. So was Charlene. And again, if we can learn anything from this case and from Tim's story, it's to trust your gut because clearly something was up that night. They all had a bad feeling about it. And I'm sure not having any other offers had a lot to do with it. It had been weeks that had been listed and they really wanted to get rid of this truck. Finally, someone shows up wanting to view it and buy it and they seemed really eager to. So why would they turn that down, you know, when they hadn't had any other opportunities? And it seemed like, you know, the only people that wanted this truck. Charlene said in an interview that the worst they thought would happen if Tim did go on this drive was they'd steal the truck and that they'd have no ride to go to work the next morning. So unfortunately, Charlene ended up telling Tim, you know, just go on the test drive. So with that, Tim told his wife he'd be right back. He gave her a kiss and he left with the two men. Tim and the two men would never come back though, which it just, this case just gives me chills. I can't even imagine sending my husband off with two strangers to go test drive the truck you're trying to sell and then he just doesn't come back. When an hour passed and Tim never showed back up, Charlene tried texting and calling him and she knew that Tim's phone had been charged, that he would have answered, and she knew right then that something was very wrong and she contacted the police. My husband Tim is a loving father to our beautiful two-year-old girl and she needs her daddy back. His parents need their little boy back. And all of our brothers and sisters want their brother back. We look forward to being able to putting our arms around Tim again and telling him how much we love him. We hope and we pray that today is the last day of this nightmare. 
tennis blonde who has wonderful blue eyes. When he gives a big smile, which he does frequently, he has dimples in his cheeks. He has a dimple in his chin. The same dimple that our daughter has. He loves to tell jokes. And if you ask his nieces and nephews, they will tell you what a huge past Uncle Timmy is. Tim's world revolves around our daughter, and I know that she is number one in his mind right now. I ask, and I beg, and I plead to whomever has my husband to please let him go. Please drop him off somewhere. Or make an anonymous call to the police so we know where to find him. It was just a truck. It is just now, a truck. You don't need him. But I do. And our daughter needs her daddy back. So please, please let him come home. So we need him to come home. So remember how I said I cried like 50 times researching this case? Well, this was one of the times and it was listening to Charlene's plea. It's just so hard putting yourself in her shoes. And when she says like, it's just a truck that I need him more than you do, it just so sad because it was just a truck. It made no sense that they wanted to kidnap him. Tim didn't live a high risk lifestyle. He didn't have any criminal activity under his belt. He was just your average guy that was trying to sell his truck and he just disappeared. And this is when everyone started realizing that this kidnapping was random and it honestly could have been anyone. But it gets worse, of course. While Charlene's waiting at home for any more information from the police, she gets a phone call and it is Tim's caller ID call. Sure, I can just picture the relief washing over her thinking, oh my God, he's fine, he's alive, he's okay, he's calling me and I'm gonna hear my husband's voice. But instead, when she answers this phone, it was actually a man claiming to have found the phone thrown in a lawn and he had found it while he was cutting the grass in a nearby industrial area. So the investigation. The police end up tracing the phone call that Tim had received from these two men and they ended up figuring out that these two men had used a burner phone. And this was a huge lead. And when they check the burner's call log, which I don't know how they did it, somehow they did it, they, they're police, they have their ways, that they checked this burner phone's call log and it ended up that days leading up to Tim's disappearance, they had actually inquired and called multiple other men who had been trying to sell similar trucks. So the first test drive that they had set up, they showed up and it was too late, so the test drive never happened. Can you imagine being the guy watching the news realizing that just days earlier, these men were calling you and at your doorstep wanting to view your vehicle and you turn them down basically. Again, Tim wasn't directly targeted, so it could have been anyone. It could have been that man with the first truck but it just ended up to be Tim. But the day before Tim, they actually ended up calling another man who was also selling a Dodger and pickup truck. Turns out that this man was an ex Israeli soldier named Igor. And unlike Tim, Igor was a big intimidating man. So I guess they felt less intimidated with Tim, but more intimidated by Igor, so they didn't try anything with him. But unlucky for these two men, Igor actually remembered a very specific tattoo that one of the men had, which is the tattoo, I think, on the wrist that said ambition on it. And this tattoo would be released to the public for any tips on who this man could be, and it would lead police to the man who would burn in the news headlines for months and years to come. And the owner of that tattoo was 27-year-old Dellen Millard. Now, 27-year-old Della Millard was the last person who police, or really anyone, would have suspected to be involved in this case. He's described everywhere as a spoiled rich kid, a millionaire bad boy, and a boy wonder. Well, who really was Della Millard? He was actually the heir to an aviation fortune, and he made headlines at 14 years old when he flew solo in a helicopter and an airplane on the same day. So you'd think he'd have it made. Dellen was born on August 30th of 1985 to Wayne Millard and Madeline Burns, growing up in Toronto and going to a private school. His father was a pilot for Air Canada, along with Millard Air, which was an aviation company that his grandfather had started. And Dellen's mother was a flight attendant for Air Canada. They also own multiple properties across the GTA that were worth multi-millions of dollars. 
And what's strange is that although they had all of this money and Dellen would be described later on as a spoiled brat, in an article from the National Post, this is how his former classmates described him. Dellen was, and I'm realizing playing into a stereotype here, a little marginalized, a little different. I didn't even know the guy was so wealthy. He always looked a little bit like a hillbilly. At a school where most students had rich parents and wore trendy outfits, Mr. Millard wore clothes more befitting a farmer. His father used to drop him off in an old pickup truck. So it's pretty interesting. It seemed like growing up, Dellen's family didn't flaunt their wealth. They weren't very flashy. They definitely seemed more old money than new money. But from where Dellen is heading, it doesn't seem like money can solve all problems. Wayne would eventually commit suicide. And this was shortly after investing multi-millions of dollars in a 50,000 square foot airplane hangar. And this airplane hangar was located at Waterloo International Airport. And it seemed like Wayne made this move because he wanted to shift the company's focus a little bit more towards airplane maintenance but it also seems like Dellen wasn't very interested in following with the family footsteps because after Wayne died and Dellen inherited all of this he ended up stopping all the plans for building and doing the business at this airplane hangar and instead turned it into a chop shop instead of continuing this very successful company that his grandfather had started he decided instead he was going to start partying more, doing harder and harder drugs, stealing stuff, and hanging out with a very bad crowd. So you can see why he's labeled as a spoiled rich kid, and we'll get to more why. A close friend of his would later describe Dellen as having a god complex and always trying to push the limits. It seemed like when Dellen hit his 20s, he started to throw bigger and wilder parties, doing harder and harder drugs, and he was the center of it. Like, he was the ringleader to it all, and he kind of thrived off of that, being the center of attention. He was also one of those older guys that had influence that liked to hang out with a younger crowd. So he was like this guy in his mid 20s and he had all of this money that he could just throw around like a big you know what. And it attracted all of these younger, poorer kids that were you know less fortunate than him that he would kind of use his money to make them like him. And that's when we introduce one of these friends, Mark Smitch. So, 23 year old Mark was a wannabe rapper. Yes, it's like a freestyle session with no lesson, no question. I'm killing you in possessions, it's mine. I'm a killer, check my design. Mountains I climb and throw you off too. Dangle you from the roof, true. Motherfuckers know I leave you blacked up and blue bruised. Who's who? Blues clues. Tell the cops anything and then you die on the news. Peace, bitch. You're deceased, kid. Fuck with me, say 10, the genius. That Blue's Clues line just, wow. <laughs> I'm just gonna say, if Mark didn't get mixed up with Dellen, I think he could have had a very promising career as a SoundCloud rapper. Those bars. <laughs> But when the two met in 2006, Dellen was like Mark's dream friend. A rich guy he could do drugs with, party with, and maybe he could even help him, you know, make music. Mark grew up much different than Dellen. He came from a middle class family. He had a criminal record involving petty crimes, such as driving impaired and drug possession. And from what I read, it seemed like Mark sold cigarettes and drugs for a living. Maybe, I'm assuming weed, maybe. Um, and then he would also work odd jobs with Dellen. According to a book written by Anne Brocklehurst about the crimes, Dellen and Mark's friendship was what you call one-sided. Described as Mark worships Dell, but Dell hated him. Another article described Mark as a high school dropout and Millard's errand boy. But it seemed like after six years of their friendship, they grew closer and they grew close enough where Dellen allowed Mark and his girlfriend to move into a basement of one of his properties. So, and this is also around the times when the missions started. So these missions. Remember that airplane hangar that Wayne purchased before he died? Well, Dellen wasn't just partying in it. He'd actually turn this 50,000 square foot, multi-million dollar airplane hangar at an airport into a chop shop. His little gang would go off in what they called missions, which was basically just them stealing anything they could get their hands on for the thrill of it. And this was everything from cars to construction equipment. This is Dylan holding his rocket launcher. They'd steal it, strip it down, sell it for parts. And again, you need to remember in this whole video that Dylan was rich. He could have afforded anything he wanted. So he wasn't doing this for the money like probably most of his little friend circle was that wasn't as fortunate as him. He could have bought whatever he wanted 10 times over and it wouldn't have hurt his pockets. And I'm sure all his little less fortunate friends really did look up to Dellen thinking like, you know, this guy has everything he hasn't made and he wants to hang out with us. Like we must be, you know, 
something to him and really I think Dellen's little crew was just a way for him to pass the time. He's really described as like a narcissist that really just thrived off of all of the attention these people were giving him. And like I said, Dellen could afford whatever he wanted and it actually turns out the day after Tim went missing, Dellen bought an, and I quote, a $627,520 37th floor, two bedroom condo in Toronto's historic distillery district, which I don't need to tell you that that's a nice ass area. And then that condo in today's age would be worth probably like $2 million. If I'm being honest, I wouldn't put it past the Toronto housing market. But if that doesn't say anything that this man, he had multiple properties, but the day after Tim goes missing after he kidnaps a man for his truck for no reason, a truck that he could buy, he buys a half a million dollar condo on top of the other properties he has like it's just so ridiculous in the fifth estates episode of Dellen, they also mentioned that these missions also included pornography which they took a lot of it in the airplanes as well as drug dealing and then of course the robbery that they liked to do so but enough of Dellen's escapades let's get back to trying to find tim bosman so igor tells the police about this tattoo and it leads to Dellen Millard. Well, five days after Tim goes missing, police track Dellen to a bank where he's taking out $3,000 and they arrest him. And surprise, surprise, because Dellen is a narcissist and thinks he can get away with anything. He has none other than Tim Bosma's keys in his pocket. The audacity of Dellen Millard. So Dellen's caught. He tells police where Tim is and a story. Wrong. Dylan decides he's not going to talk. So police decide to start going through surveillance footage to try to figure out what happened. They end up finding footage of what they think is Tim's truck, where they found Tim's phone. They end up finding footage of two vehicles that they believe to be Tim's and the second one right behind it, they believe to be Dylan's SUV. So at some point they must have pulled over, Dylan must have gotten out, got into his own vehicle and then followed behind. So they're getting closer to figuring out where they took Tim. And oh, I, I don't know if I, I mentioned, I thought it was pretty clear though, that like Mark was also involved in this. It was Dylan and Mark that showed up to Tim's house to test drive the car. So it was the two of them, just to, if I didn't make it clear enough. <laughs> so they decide to look at the footage from Dylan's airplane hangar. And two hours later, two vehicles pull up to the hangar, but this time Tim's truck is towing a large piece of equipment. It shows what's thought to be Dylan and Mark walking through the hangar, but there's no Tim. Until moments later, there is a huge eruption of flames on the outside camera and this camera is pointing into the yard and whatever it is would burn all night. When police search the hangar though, Tim is nowhere to be found, his truck's nowhere to be found either. So they go back and look at the surveillance footage again. Two days after Tim went missing, Dellen's truck is spotted on surveillance towing a huge trailer. And I want you to pause the video for a second and take a guess where Dellen was taking this trailer and what was inside of it. Anyone? It it's so ridiculous that you will probably be right. Turns out that Dellen decided to hide Tim's truck on his mother's property and the trailer was registered to Millard Air. I said he was a rich dude, not a smart dude, okay? A tip from neighbors is what led police to search Dellen's mother's property and that's where they found the truck, you know? And Tim's truck was of course inside of this trailer that he was trying to hide on his mother's property, so. Yeah. It turns out that they had attempted to strip the two front seats out of the truck, but while they did do that and they did try to clean up all of the evidence inside, they left some very crucial things, such as a bullet casing, Tim's blood, Dylan's own fingerprints were inside of Tim's truck as well, and then when they did a luminol test, they found a lot of blood. To say they, they didn't really do a good job at trying to hide the evidence there either. Along with all that, a 38 caliber pistol was also found in a toolbox owned by Dylan Millard. <sighs> but all of that blood was not good news about Tim. So police are out combing the area, trying to get more leads, find anything that they can to try to figure out where Tim is. And police run into a man on a four wheeler and they end up flagging him over. They ask this man if he had seen anything unusual in the area and it turns out that he did. This man would lead police to Dellen's land and hidden in the woods on Dellen's farm property. Police find what is called the eliminator. And the eliminator is an industrial incinerator used for livestock. And it was actually strapped to a trailer that would make it mobile, which kind of connects the dots to what Tim's truck was pulling behind it that night. Well, police start to connect the dots and this is where it gets even more fucked up because police start to believe that that night in that video footage, they had literally used Tim's own truck to pull behind it 
the incinerator that they would later throw his body into. And that, that incinerator was what was burning all night in that surveillance footage. So please bring in a forensic pathologist that goes over the eliminator. She actually got inside of it and used like a little vacuum to like suck everything up that was inside. And they actually end up finding fragments of Tim's bones. They found his tooth in there and they also found blood and it all matched Tim Bosma. So there's never been an official story of what happened because when Dylan and Mark were arrested, both of them started pointing fingers at each other. So no one knows exactly how it went down, but it seems that sometime after Tim left with Dylan and Mark, they shot him in the head and then disposed of his body in the eliminator. But you know, of course when they were arrested, Mark ended up snitching on Dylan, saying that he was only in on it to steal the car and that Dylan was the one that had shot Tim and that he was like so scared for his life that he went along with everything that Dylan did because he didn't want to be the next one, you know, shot. One of those things. So no one really knows who to believe here. Like I can understand that because Dylan did have this kind of sway over all of his friends. I could see them being scared of him and but at the same time, like, dude, you're you're no innocent bystander here. Like you were literally in on this from the start. And the way that Dylan coped with all of this was that he sent his girlfriend tons and tons of letters telling her to lie to the police. And he was also suggesting that it was Mark and another friend that had went on this test drive and he never went on the test drive. Sure, Dylan. Now Dylan and Mark get caught. The police have a pretty good idea what happened. They've pretty much found him. Again, end of story, right? No, it, this keeps going. In 2012, a 23 year old woman by the name of Laura Babcock went missing in Toronto. And at the time of Dylan's arrest, she had been missing for five years. She just vanished. And so I've seen Laura described as someone who was struggling with her mental health, that she had a drug problem, that she was doing escorting, and she was currently homeless at the time of her disappearance and like couch hopping between friends. But I've also seen that that kind of had spiraled in the last like year before her disappearance. But still then, and before that, Laura was described as completely different than that. She was described as kind and bubbly and like any 23 year old girl, she was glued to her Blackberry and that she was the life of the party and she had like lots and lots of friends. It just seemed that when she got caught in the web of Dellen Millard, that her life started to take a tailspin. And from what I gathered, it seemed that police didn't really take her disappearance that seriously. They kind of looked at her as having a high-risk lifestyle. They were like, oh, whatever, she's an escort, which we've seen time and time again with people that live high-risk lifestyles, their disappearances or murders getting swept under the rug. And that is what happened with Laura. The police never looked into it. Even though Laura's ex-boyfriend went to the police and brought them evidence that the last person she was with was Dellen Millard and that the last person she had contacted was Dellen Millard. Police didn't really care. He was a rich guy. It turns out that Dellen and Laura met at a bar in downtown Toronto. They had like a short brief fling. They dated for like a month or so. And then after that, it was kind of like they were friends, but they still had something clearly going on for the next year or so. You know, and like all of Dellen's encounters, it seemed normal enough until it wasn't. But what would motivate Dellen to kill Laura. What was his reasoning there? Well, it seemed like there was a love triangle going on between Dylan, his girlfriend, Christina Nuga, and Laura. And it also seemed that Christina and Laura had been feuding for quite a while. There were a bunch of text messages I seen on the Fifth Estates um, video, which you should definitely check out. I really like that documentary that they did on it. But they were kind of going back and forth with like, oh, I slept with him last month. And then she'd be like, oh, I, well, I slept with him last week kind of thing. And they had this like competition going on between them, it seemed like for Dellen. And honestly, like, Ugh. police had actually found multiple text conversations that Dellen had sent to Christina. One of them reading, first, I'm going to hurt her. Then I'll make her leave. I will remove her from our lives. And that wasn't the only evidence pointing towards Dellen doing something to Laura. Even though Dellen had said that he had called it quits with Laura, he told her he didn't want to talk to her anymore. The days leading up to Laura's disappearance, Dellen and Laura had 110 different text and phone call conversations between the two of them. And her last outgoing call was actually traced back to the area of Dellen's Tobacco home. Police had figured out that Dellen and Laura actually met up at Kipling subway station, which is the last stop on the line in Etobicoke. And after that, they proceeded to Dellen's house. And from then on, there were no more outgoing calls or texts from Laura's phone. And Laura was a very social person. So five years of no texts or phone calls, 
It was very odd. On top of that, Dellen had bought the Eliminator right before Laura vanished. There's actually a photo of Mark standing in front of the Eliminator, and it's thought that that picture was taken the night that Laura's body was burnt in it. On top of that, Dellen actually sent this text message to Mark because again, they're such smart criminals. He said, barbecue has run its warm up. It's ready for meat. <sighs> that is just so disgusting. Like, but there's even more evidence. Laura's iPad had been connected to Dellen's computer and renamed Mark's iPad. And this photo was also saved on Dellen's phone the exact same day. It's Dellen's dog next to a rolled up tarp on the ground. What's wrapped in that tarp? Hey, Deli. Oh yeah, and also because he's such a dumb criminal, he also Googled how hot a cremation is done at. So yeah. The next day, Mark used Laura's iPad to write a rap song about her murder. The bitch started off all skin and bone. Now the bitch lay on some ash stone. Last time I saw her outside the home. And if you go swimming, you can find a phone. Find a phone? What? What? Find a phone. If you go swimming, you can find a phone. Find a phone. Find a phone. You can find a phone. If you go swimming, you can find a phone. Bitch, lay on some ash stone. I don't even know what to say about that. So with all of that and more, prosecutors believed that Laura's body had been incinerated and without a body, they still put the two men on trial. So this just went from a single murder to a double murder under these men's belts. And guess what? Thankfully, they were found guilty for both Tim and Laura's murders. And even though to this day, Laura's remains were never found, probably because they were incinerated, the judicial system actually did something right for once and they actually charged both the men with first degree murder. Both Dellen and Mark were sentenced to 25 years years to run concurrently with their sentence for Tim's murder. So another 25 years. So that's 50 years for both of them. So at this point, they don't have a parole until 2063. So, so they're sitting pretty good in jail for a while. But things just keep getting more interesting the deeper and deeper police delve into Dellen's life. Remember Dellen's dad, Wayne, that supposedly killed himself? Well, that was back in 2012 and he was found with a gunshot wound to his left eye. And it turns out that the gun that was used to shoot, assumably himself, was traced back to Dellen and a notorious gun dealer in Toronto. And this notorious gun dealer is someone that Dellen was associated with. Thankfully, Wayne's case was reclassified from a suicide to a homicide. It was actually discovered that Dellen and his father were having disagreements about the family business. And in court, Dellen ended up calling his father a failure and he blamed his father for the family business's losses. Meanwhile, the truth is actually going to come out to why this probably happened. It seems like Wayne was about to cut Dellen off because he was wasting money partying and doing drugs and doing literally nothing for the family business. So what does that mean? Does that mean there are now three murders? Dellen was in fact ultimately charged separately for the murder of his father. And this wasn't a jury trial, it was a trial by judge and Dellen doesn't testify. His lawyer insisted that his father's death was a suicide and that the crown had no proof of motive, which I don't understand how you could say that when literally there, the proof was right there. He was gonna cut him off and Dellen was just acting like a piece of shit in this decided that he didn't want his daddy to cut him off from the fortune. Because then what money would he have? He was literally a low life without the money. He had like literally nothing to put under his name besides that when he was 14, he literally had a great career. He had more of a career at 14 than he did at 27. Like, but of course the crown had a ton of evidence to support their claim. That also included that Dellen had purchased the gun, which had killed his father. And it would actually turn out that this gun was also purchased right before Laura died. There was also the fact that Dellen's phone had been at his father's home around 1 a.m. that night, according to cell phone pings, and it also stayed there shortly after 6 a.m. So then in 2018, so it was actually pretty recently, Dellen was found guilty of first degree murder in the death of his father. And the judge had basically come to the conclusion that that night between 1 and 6 a.m., Dellen had shot his father while he was sleeping. So that 50 year sentence just got upgraded to a good 75 year sentence. So uh, at this point, Dellen won't be out till he's around 103 years old. So so I'm sure he'll have a lot of partying to make up for when he gets out. It's just, this case is so tragic in so many ways. This dude had all the fucking opportunities in the world to do whatever he wanted. He could have jumped in his own airplane and flown to Bora Bora to drink Mai Tais on the beach, but instead he decided to become a murderer and a criminal. You know, like what a waste of life. What a waste of his own life and the three lives that he took for no reason. Especially Tim. Like obviously all three of these deaths had no meaning to them, but literally it was so 
sporadic with Tim. It could have been anyone. With Laura and Wayne, there was some motive behind it. They were specifically targeted. But with Tim, it was so random. It could have been the guy from three days ago they went to go check on his truck. But they just decided it was a motive of opportunity. Tim was a nice guy and he decided to take them out that late at night still. And he paid the price for it. And again, there was no reason to kill Tim. They could have just kicked him out of his car and stole it but instead they decided to murder him. Like it was just so fucking senseless. And on top of that, what just keeps making it worse is that Dellen had no financial reason to do it. Most people that steal vehicles and do things like this, do it for a financial reason because they have no money and they wanna be like people like Dellen. Meanwhile, Dellen's acting like, it just, it's so frustrating. This man is so frustrating. Dolan could have went out and bought a hundred trucks, but instead he decided to steal Tim's truck and murder him. It just makes it so much worse that he was robbing people of things that he could afford to buy. And that just makes it even more clear that he was doing it for narcissistic reasons. He loved the danger aspect of it all. He loved the thrill of it. And it makes you realize how dangerous Dellen Millard really is. You know, Tim was just trying to make some extra cash for his family and instead he got murdered for it. Laura fell in love with a guy that she honestly did not deserve. She, de she deserved so much better than Dylan. And falling in love with him got her killed. And then there's Wayne who literally gave his son everything in the world that he could want. And he was so greedy and disrespectful that he went and murdered his own father so his father wouldn't cut him off. The fact that he got away with Laura's murder for so long probably made him feel like a god, like he was invincible. So as I said, there's an episode of The Fifth Estate that covered this case and I definitely recommend you watching it. I really love the way that they told the story and they go into detail of each of the murders and you get to hear a lot from the family members in it. Also, it's just so, so crazy that the police didn't take Laura's case seriously. And if you really think about it, the fact that if they had listened to Laura's ex-boyfriend when he went to the police and brought him literal evidence that Dellen Millard was the last person she was seen with and before she disappeared. If the police had looked into that, they had Dellen's name, they had his phone number, they had everything right in front of them and they didn't even go and talk to him or give him a call. If they had went and done that, Tim and Wayne could be alive right now. They didn't have to die if the police had literally just done their job in the first place. But no, I could definitely see that they seen Laura and said, okay, she's just an escort and Dylan, he's a rich kid from a very affluent family. And they thought, eh, there's no way he would have done that. I'm not going to go and disturb this affluent family. Not looking in the Dylan Millard right away led to Tim Bosma and Way Millard's deaths. And that is so fucked up. That's what really gets me and that they literally could have stopped Tim Bosma and Wayne from dying. But in the end, I guess at least some way, somehow there was justice in this case. Dylan and Mark were both caught. They were actually sentenced properly and they're never, they're pretty much never gonna end up getting out of jail. They're gonna die in jail. And I hope that leads to some hope that we'll find justice in other unsolved cases. But this is the story of one of Toronto's most notorious serial killers that no one talks about. And the three people that senselessly were murdered. Let me know what you think about this case below. And obviously hit that subscribe button if you're not subscribed. I upload true crime videos weekly. Sometimes more, sometimes maybe a little less. Um, but we're trying for weekly. So definitely hit that subscribe button if you want to get notified. When I do post, click that little bell and you'll get a notification. And with that, I will see you in my next video.